excited that you're joining us today, whether that is on Facebook Live or here in person. It's just an awesome day to be together and worship God. It's also the last time of 2020 that we will be together um, in church. <laughs> and someone just cheered because I think they're excited to say goodbye to 2020. I know I am. <laughs> to welcome in 2021, we are going to be doing a week of prayer. That will be every night from January 3rd to January 9th. It'll start at 7 here at the church, but then we'll go live on Facebook at 7.30, and you will be able to post comments since the comment section that you for prayer request. Um, but then also if you're here, you obviously will do prayer requests and do prayer that way as well. Um, to welcome in the new year, we're hitting off a new sermon series. Um, we thought a little bit on how, what to name it, and I think we're going to name it Leave the Dumpster Fire of 2020 Behind. Um, so it's just going to be focused on how to seek God and meet him in 2021, um, which I think is really important because this has just been a kind of an icky year. Uh, so how can we move on from such an icky year? So we're going to take the next couple minutes and worship God. Um, we were created to worship. That's one of our main purposes. Luke 19.39 through 40 tells us that if we keep quiet, the very stones would cry out. Um, so God's pouring out his love on us today. And in response, we are going to give him his, what he deserves, the worship. So dear Jesus, thank you so much that you love on us, Lord God. We pray right now that we begin to worship you, Lord God, that we get have an encounter with you, Lord God. Give us a fresh outpouring of you today, Lord God. Holding on to you for life The desert will never take my soul Do you believe that? Oh, the desert
the pain, the stronger my faith will grow. The higher the need, the higher I'll reach. The greater the cost.
Lord God. Where your spirit is, is where we will go. Sing that again. Where you are, God, is where we want to be. Where you are, God, is where we want to be. Where your spirit is, is where we'll go. opportunity to worship Jesus on a Sunday morning in 2020 and it's been a year of challenging worship so let's just worship him for a moment let's I don't want to leave this year without thanking him for getting us through this year and without worshiping him for being God even in the middle of this strange year so let's just take a minute and lift our voices to worship him dear Lord we love you and we worship you Jesus we worship you Jesus Lord we worship you we praise you Jesus Thank you for bringing us through this year, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your presence and your power, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. 
Yes, Jesus. Just lift your hearts to him right now. Just lift your voice to him. We worship you, Jesus. We need your presence, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Lord, we pray for this fresh outpouring this year. Lord. Pour out upon us, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And if we can bring ourselves to worship a minute, you can get through it. So 2020 has been a year where we've learned to worship in the middle of whatever storm comes up. We've learned to worship Jesus. So uh, the, the secret to life is more of Jesus. And more of Jesus comes when we worship Jesus in the middle of wherever we are. So just keep lifting your hearts toward him as we as we go through this service, as we move into this next year, I want to bring in this year in an attitude of worshiping Jesus, an attitude of expectation for what he's about to do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, it's this week between Christmas and New Year's, and I've always wondered what you do during this week because everything, everything was abnormal in 2020, and now it's especially abnormal because we have this week where everything is especially shut down. So we've had some good things. Our good friend Casey's here, if you uh, remember him from years ago, an old-time lcc -er. He's here, and uh, he came to see us, but a lot of you are on camera, so he can't see you on camera. But he is here, so greet Casey, if, you're, if you remember him there in the comments. And uh, I was flipping through the newspaper, and I, I uh, came across, I, I know Tyler Kelly. If you know Tyler, he's one of our young people we're very proud of, and I knew he was going to have a picture or two in the paper, but he's got the whole paper, so uh, he's got, like, the, I don't know if you can see it there on camera, but he's got the front page, and he's got the whole center section of pictures there. Go to falkier.com, and, you, and you'll find these uh, on Falkier, and, and, you know, kind of support Tyler, because these are great pictures. I mean, they're, they're, they're he, the guy has an eye for photography, and so if you want to support him a little bit in that, Go to falkier.com and make some comments about how great these pictures are and uh, maybe even write a little letter to the editor and tell her how much you appreciated uh, Tyler's work there in the newspaper because I did. It, it was a, definitely a bright spot. We're really proud. I'm proud when I see some of our young people come up and find their, what God made them for and find something that gives them energy and succeed in doing that. And that's something we all need to do. We all need to find that thing that God made us for, and uh, Tyler seems to have a lot of energy in that. So go there and look at that, falkier.com. Not, not right now because you're in the middle of church, but uh, afterwards go to falkier.com, and they will put a link up there where you can go. And, and make sure you make some comments or write a letter to the editor and, and uh, tell her just how great those pictures were and how they brightened up your year and how you demand to see more Tyler Carey pictures in the newspaper. And you would you would subscribe to the newspaper and probably get three or four copies if it was mostly Tyler Kelly pictures. So, um, I mean, really, we've got to support one another. So it's a new year, and a new year, uh, the good thing about a new year is it's kind of a new page, a blank slate, a new start. And how many of you all think we could probably use a new start after 2020? How many of you all would say, this point last year, you saw anything that was coming in 2020? I mean, yeah, I knew 2020 would be this way. Not, not one of us had a clue that it would be this way. So we do have a new start, a new thing. And, you know, 2020 sometimes seemed out of control. It just seemed overwhelming. It seemed like one more thing and how many more things could happen in one year. I, I lay down at night and I, I hold my wife and I think about things and I pray about things. And Linda and I were talking about it the other night. And I said, you know, for me at least, 2020, there there are a handful of things that could happen in this world that would change my world. And none of those things happened in 2020, so I'm grateful. And maybe they did happen for you, and they will happen for us eventually. The word you've lost a child or lost your spouse or lost someone you care about, none of, none of that happened this year. Uh, so the, the really important stuff is still there, but 2020 still seemed out of control and overwhelming. You, you know, what we do with what we get, <clears throat> we write our own story. And we write our future. We write what we're doing and how you can't help what happens to you in the world, but you can help how you respond to it. You can help how you write the story based on what happens. So 2020 largely illustrates to us we're out of control with what goes on outside of us, 
But what we did in 2020 was up to us. There are a lot of things that will happen to you, and, and you know, there, are nothing, there is nothing that will happen to you in 2021 or did happen in 2020 that you can't choose how you're going to respond to it. Everything that happens to you, you get to choose the response. Sometimes the new year can be scary. Um, I said to somebody the other day, and they got angry at me, but uh, they said, I'm sure glad 2021's coming. And I said, yeah, let's just hope it's not the kind of year where we look back on 2020 and say, we missed that, because it could be. It could get worse. It could j- you can't help how the world moves and what goes on in the world, and you can stress about it and worry about politics and disease and all the things of the world. The only real thing you can do is choose your response to it. So the truth is, you were never a victim of circumstances in 2020, and you won't be in 2021. You're the player. You're the one who writes your story based on what goes on. So the goal for us as a church, we're we're going to do a quick series here where we look at how we focus 2021. It, It fits where we are in numbers a little bit because these last 10 chapters of numbers, they're waiting for the new season. They're waiting for the next season. And it's this random assemblage of how they manage their time, talent, treasure, how they manage their people how they respect people. And so as we're, go- as, as we're going through this next couple of weeks, you want, might want to read the last 10 chapters of Numbers over and over. We're not going to go through those line by line, but we are kind of drawing some principles out of there. The goal for us as we conclude Numbers and move into 2021 is that we all learn to write our story in 2021, that we learn to take ourselves to the next level, that we learn how to write and author our own story rather than letting the world happen to us. There are three kinds of people in the world. They're kind of people that make things happen. They're kind of people that sit back and watch things happen. And the third kind of people is the kind of people that have no idea what is happening. And the truth is, a lot of people in 2021 were, or 2020 were the kind of people that had no idea what was happening. And a lot of people sat back and observed what was happening. My goal for 2021 is no matter what happens, that every LCC is part of the first group. They know how to make things happen no matter what's going on. You know, the number one way we can do this is to learn how to set a few goals. Learn how to have a goal in mind, a future, a plan, something moving forward. Have some goals for 2021. The Bible tells us without a vision, people perish. If we don't have a goal, we sit around and watch Netflix. If we don't have a goal, we sit around and put on 40 pounds during a pandemic. If we don't have a goal, we sit and waste and we wonder where 2020 went. And and the truth is, a lot of us, because our goals were so derailed in 2020, all that we sat down as a staff and tried to come up with these great goals and great plans for 2020 at the beginning of January last year. And the truth is, they were all derailed. Not one of them happened. But we set new goals. We set new ideas because if we don't have a goal, we we just sit around and do absolutely nothing. So you need a goal, a dream, a vision, an ambition, a target for 2021. You need something to focus your life in 2021. So the next couple of weeks, that's what we're going to look at, setting a few goals for 2021, some different areas of our life where we could make a difference in 2021. Hopefully it energizes you as we go into this year. We can't control what happens in the political world or the healthcare world, or we can't, we can't control any of the things that go on, but what we can do is choose how we're going to go through them. In 2021, I'd like to reach some people as a church. I think as this pandemic loosens up, People will be responsive to community and responsive to God. And I don't see why it's wrong that we ask God if we can reach at least 100 people this year. And I think that sounds crazy right now, but I think it's a goal we could have together. I want to learn as a church how we do relationships in this new world, this online, strange, hybrid world. I want to learn how we, I mean, you're watching this, most of you on video. I want to learn how we can build real relationships somehow between here and the video and the screen and and what you're watching. Watching. And the main goal I have for us, for each of us in this church, is that we grow and become more like Jesus. And 2020 has been a great year to become more like Jesus because we've learned that we're not in control and we have to trust God. We've had time because we could focus on Jesus. We've had, because of the stress and worry, sometimes it's forced us to look more into Jesus and we become more like Jesus. 2021 will be the greatest year of our history together as a church and your greatest year in your life if we learn to set a few goals. 
So we need godly goals. What are godly goals? Well, the Bible tells us this. The godly are showered with blessings by God. Let's take a quick LCC poll. How many of you all would like to be showered with blessings in 2021? I mean, anybody don't want no blessings in 2021? No, thank you, God. I'd like 2021 to be just like 2020. I'd like to, I'd like to see a lot of things I love go away. I don't want blessings. So I'd like to live in that shower of blessing in 2021. I think we all would. And the Bible tells us the godly are showered by blessings from God. Uh, the godly are showered. Why? Because God loves to bless the godly. God loves to bless people who are inclined towards him. It's the character of God. God is a blesser of people who, who are trying to be like him. He blesses us. He can't help but do it. It's not something he does. It's something he is. He is a blesser to those who are willing to follow him. So when we set some godly goals, we're setting goals that God blesses, that God, please, God is pleased with. We're setting goals that God is able to bless us in our life. We're opening up the portal. We're opening up the, 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 the receiver to receive the blessings that God has for us in 2021. 95% of Americans, in a poll I read a few years back, have no written goals for their life. Think about it. If you would write down your goals for 2021, a couple of goals, plans, ambitions for 2021, you'd be in the top 5% of the nation. Simple truth is most people drift through life and wonder where it went. If you have no written goals, you're in a good place today because you'll need this series. You'll need the next couple of weeks so that you can write down some things that will focus your life in 2021. Goals make changes in us. They shape us. Because you have a goal, it changes everything. It changes who you are, how you're behaving, how you respond. It gives you something bigger than the circumstances around you. It shapes your destiny. It literally writes your future, and it writes the story of the year that you're living in. So let's look first at four reasons why I need to set a few goals in 2021. First of all, godly goals give me hope. Goals are about hope, aren't they? They're about the future. Goals aren't about what we have. Goals are about what we believe God can do in the future. It gives us some hope. Um, there's something called the Stockdale Paradox. The Stockdale Paradox had to do with the prisoners of war in Vietnam and, and, and whether they could survive the length of time they were in Vietnam. Uh, it's named after a guy named David Stockdale, who was a prisoner of war in, in Vietnam. Stockdale said that those who survived the prison camp were those who had goals, but not these goals that were impossible. Some of them had a goal to be home by Christmas, and when they weren't, they pined away and died. They were deflated. Stockdale had goals like surviving today without going crazy. Stockdale had goals that were attainable that he could reach to, but yet they reached and stretched him and required hope and faith and future. And he said those are the people who survive. People who survive tragedy have goals, not some weird, weird lofty goal like let's reach 4 billion people this year or something. They have goals like let's reach 100. Let's reach 100. That's a stretch for us. Let's reach 100. Something to live for, something to move forward to. Life is full of losses, unfortunately. You know, truthfully, you'll probably lose something in 2021. Every year on New Year's Eve, I sit back and think, I wonder what the next year will bring in loss. And I look back over what we have lost in the last year. And, and I think 2021 will probably bring some loss. We might lose a loved one, might lose a job, might lose our homes for all we know. Life is sometimes full of illnesses. The truth is you'll probably get sick in 2021. Uh, it could be the flu. It could be a cold. It could be the dreaded COVID word. It could be uh, the truth is we'll probably get sick, and some of us will get sick in 2021. Life's full of tragedies. It's full of accidents. And the problem is if you don't set some goals, you get stuck in those problems. You get stuck in the tragedies. You get stuck there, and you can't get out of them. Godly goals keep us moving forward even when we feel like quitting. Even when we're bogging down in the mud of life, godly goals keep us moving forward and out of it. Godly goals then give us hope and endurance. In the Bible, a guy named Job loses everything except his nagging wife, interestingly enough. The only thing that's left is his nagging wife. And so Job's there with his nagging wife. And in chapter 6, verse 11 of Job, he says, I do not have the strength to endure. Why? He says, because I do not have a goal that encourages me to carry on. 
the greatest tragedy is not losing everything. The greatest tragedy is having no goal in the middle of that loss. The greatest tragedy is to have nothing to pull us forward out of that loss. You will lose something in the future, and without a goal, you'll get stuck there in it. If you have no goals, you're just drifting. You're a ship without a heading and a rudder. You're in the sea going whichever way the world pushes you. you whatever happens in the world pushes you in whatever direction it wants to go. If you have no goals, you really have nowhere to go. You have no reason to keep going. You have no reason to move forward. Why get out of bed if there's nothing to grab today? Why get out of bed and seize the day if I have no goal for the day? Why get up? And some of you have encountered that because your goals were shattered in 2020 and you didn't set new goals. And so you were wondering why get out of bed. Some of you are in depression right now because you have nothing to pull you forward out of where you are. Some of you felt this in 2020, and you're going to need this series because we're going to have to answer the question, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? What am I going to do in 2021? When I sit back at Christmas 2021, what would make me say that was a year that mattered? That was a year that changed things. It changed this church, this community. It changed me, my family. It was a year that made a difference. And the truth is, when I'm talking about goals, they don't have to be huge things to motivate us. Sometimes huge goals demotivate us because they're so large we can't do them. Sometimes we need the little goals that lead us to the huge goals. If you've ever had surgery, they never told you, why don't we go run a marathon tomorrow? If you've ever had surgery, the goal is to get your feet over the edge of the bed the next morning. And then maybe by lunch, they say, we're going to have you standing up. And then maybe they're going to have you take 10 steps down the hall by the end of the day. 10 steps and a very lofty goal, but it moves you forward. Goals sometimes move us forward, and those goals pull us forward. So the point is, small goals are important goals if they give you hope. If they pull you forward, any goal is an important goal. Last year was a hard year for most of us. A lot of us lost stuff. It's a new world. Everything is different. I'm a hugging, outgoing, love people, and I am sitting at home going stir crazy, and I want to hug people, and I want to be around people, and Christmas really brought that out, and you sense that loss. It's been a year full of noise, and the best way I can describe whatever you watch on cable news or whatever you watch in the world, and half the junk on Facebook and half the junk online, it's noise. It's just a bunch of static and noise, and that noise was drowning out the voice of God and, and goals and visions this year. You know, what it left me with was taking one step at a time. In March, when we had to go to online-only church, it left us taking one step. We've just got to get this happening. It left me doing one thing at a time. It left me taking, how do we have church next week? How do we do this next week? How do I speak to a camera? How do we do church? Do you know, you know how different it was? I've done radio sermons where I'm in a room with a microphone only, but I've never sat and done sermons with nobody, no human being to look at and only look into a lens. And so the goal was to get good at looking at a lens. It was simple goals that pulled me forward every week this year. Started renovating some of our house. It gave me something tangible that I could do. Simple goals gave me a reason to get out of bed and do something. You need some goals that give you a reason to get out of bed and do something today. Uh, we set all these great big goals last January and staff and, 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 and as our board and, and all of us, but all those goals really became get through next week. And you know what? I found out those goals of getting through next week, they do pull you forward. They give you something to look forward to. You know, here's the idea. If you're going through hell in life, why stop? If you're in the middle of hell right now, if life is hell for you, why stop there? You need to keep moving. You, you, you don't want to stay there, do you? You don't want to stay in the middle of hell. The truth is the only way to get out of the situation you're in is put one foot in front of the other, set a goal. Maybe the biggest goal is just to get your foot moving the first time. Maybe that goal pulls you forward. Maybe it's not get out of the situation I am, but maybe it's take a step. And maybe that attainable step is what motivates us. One of the verses that kept me going in 2020 was this, Jeremiah 29, 11, something everybody should memorize. God says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And when I would try to get depressed and out this year and down and think that life was useless and all my goals were shot, God would remind me, I know the plans that I have for you, and this is part of them. 
My plans are hope and future. Not that you'd bog down in 2020 and stay there. My plans were to bring you through it into a place of new prosperity, a shower of blessing. Every little goal brings me closer to his ultimate goal for me. Every little goal pulls me out of bed in the morning, pulls me into the church on Sunday, pulls me into connecting with people because God has given me another step, another goal. And the result of the whole thing is we end up trusting God more. You know, I've learned this year that Liberty Community Church is his church. I, I, I've got all this education and all this experience and all that, know every way of, to build a church except for I have no idea how to build a church and reach people in a pandemic. And everything that I know is pretty useless. And every time I come to God and say, look, I know, knew what to do, he says, yeah, and you have no idea now, you're going to have to trust me for my church. It's my church. I built it, and I have a plan for it. Your job is to sit down, shut up, and hold on, and wait until I do what I want to do. And that's pulled me through every day. Every day I say, God, give me another step in your plan. Give me another step on what you're trying to do. Some of us get stuck in our past. We get stuck in our present problem. So all we can see is the problem. A goal is seeing past the problem into the future. And it's much easier to move forward when you have a goal, even if it is one step, even if it's a slight movement. If you have no goal, truth is you'll just drift from one problem to the next. The world will serve you up a line of problems that will just keep coming to you and pushing. You ever been around people, or maybe you are one of those people, it just seems like it's one problem after another. It's because you're stuck there without any goal to pull you forward. So goals give me hope, and the second thing goals do is they focus my energy and they help focus my life. Goals focus me. Instead of being scattered, they focus me. The secret to successful living is to focus. The kind of person who can do everything is actually weak at everything. For some of you, you're pretty smart people, and you could do almost anything. For some of you, you're blessed with not being so smart, so you've always been kind of focused on what you could do. But for most of you here, you're pretty smart, pretty intelligent, and pretty active, and pretty capable of almost anything. And there's a real danger there when you can do almost anything that you will do everything, and you won't be any good in any one thing. You'll just be below average at everything. The secret to real life is to do some, a few things well. An effective life focuses. Uh, this year I've worked through uh, Newbar's serenity prayer every day in my prayer life because it's what kept me moving in the first few months of this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. Give me the courage to change the things that I can change and give me the wisdom to know the difference. And I quit fighting the things and I quit trying to do the things that God didn't tell me to do. And I quit trying to do the things that I couldn't do. And I started putting my goals and energy in the things that God told me to do. The things that I needed the courage from God to do. And I ask him every day, help me to know the difference. Help me to know the difference. And it's been the center of my prayer. And I suggest maybe as we move into this week of prayer, the week after next, starting this Sunday, uh, as we move into this, um, Consider praying that every day. Consider writing that prayer down and consider asking God to help focus you. What I'm talking about is set some goals because when you don't set goals, we're overwhelmed by the millions of things that we could do. The truth is you don't have time to do everything. Most people waste all of their time trying to do everything or trying to decide between everything instead of letting God focus them. If you know what you need to do, if you know what you have a goal for, you can save a lot of time because you don't have to do If you know what you're supposed to be doing, it eliminates all the millions of other things that you're not supposed to be doing. You ever waste an entire day? I'm not talking about taking a Sabbath. That's not a waste. That's focusing on God. I'm talking about you ever just get up in the morning and wonder what happened to this whole day? Thought I was going to do something and nothing has happened today. You know why you wasted that day? It's because you had no goal for the day. When you got out of bed, you didn't set any goal to have anything done for the day. And in the end, you got absolutely nothing done. You wasted a whole day. I, I wrote my doctoral thesis. It was 200, and I should have looked at it, 240 some pages long. And people ask, how do you write a 240 page paper? You know how you write a 240-page paper? You do not sit down and write it out in three hours. 
It was a year and a half of writing. It was focused. It was every day I had to take a bite of it. Every day I had to research something. Every day I had a goal. I had a thousand little goals. I had literally, I ran across it the other day, had a chart that I kept on the refrigerator so that Linda could track those goals so that she could see I was actually getting somewhere, but I had a long way yet to go. And it pulled me forward over time. But I also discovered that I needed large blocks of time to get it done. And that some things were going to have to be undone if that was ever going to be done. I was going to have to choose to do this and not do some other things. So the principle is I need to set aside some lesser things for the greater things of God. I need to set aside some of the things that are noise or busyness so that I can focus on what God wants me to do. In other words, if I have no goal, I will fritter and waste my life away on trivial pursuits, things that don't matter, things that have no goal in life. And I'll get to the end of my life and I'm going to say, where did all this go? What did I do? Did I make a difference? Did I help anybody? And the answer is no. The problem is if I have no goal, I waste my life on things that are unimportant to me or others. Linda's going to put a link up uh, to a, a Eisenhower window. And um, I don't know if it'll be up here or not, but um, uh, we've talked about this Eisenhower window before. It's a four block matrix. And on this four block matrix, and, and hopefully she's got it up on the online version and maybe up here, but well, Eisenhower matrix gives us a way of looking at things in our life. If you look at that four part matrix, in the top left corner is things that are both important, highly important, and highly urgent. They're critical and they're immediate. They're things that need done now and they're very important. They're things like the building is on fire, get out. That would be both critical or important and it would be urgent, correct? I can't sit around and think about that. I need to get out. There are a few things in life that are both important and urgent. And if our life's in order, there's not that many things that are both important and urgent, but they do need done now. And, and then the top right-hand box, those are things that are not urgent at all. They don't have to be done today. They can be done whenever, but they are very important. Some of the things that are like that are things like exercise. You, you know what happens when you skip a day of exercise? Not much. You know what happens when you skip a day of Bible reading? Not much. You know what happens when you skip a year of Bible reading? A lot. You know what happens when you skip a year of exercise? You, your pants don't fit no more. Simple truth is, it's not that urgent, but it's very important, isn't it? And, and, and you know what happens? Most of the time in the noise of life, when things shift, those are the things that disappear. These are the things we probably dropped in 2020. We probably dropped. I, I, we canceled our gym membership the other day, and I'm thinking we were great at that. We were there every day, but now we can't go. doctor told me not to go, and we're trying to figure that out. It's very important, but it's not urgent, so I can get through every day without it. What's another day? What's another day of eating bad, and, and eventually you weigh 800 pounds, and you're wondering how you got there? Well, you got there simply because it wasn't urgent, didn't have to be done now, and it never got done. Most of us are terrible at these things. Wouldn't you say amen? We're terrible at the things that aren't urgent. Okay, the building's not on fire, so we can just sit. Now, now in the bottom left-hand corner of the Eisenhower window, these are things that are not very important, but they're very urgent. And you know, I've learned over life that most of the things that are not very important, but are very urgent, are usually things that other people tell me are urgent. Things that other people want me to do. Things that other people are pushing me to do. And, and, and the simple truth is, if you have things that are not very important to you, but they're urgent, find somebody else to do it. Those are the things that you can ask somebody else to do. Those are the things, hey, why don't you do this for me? And some people will be excited. It'll be very important to them. But to me, it's not important. Life involves some things that are not very important, but they are urgent. And then the last window, the bottom right-hand window, the Eisenhower window, these are things that are neither urgent nor important. And here's what happened in 2020 to a lot of us. Because we didn't, our goals fell apart and because we slacked on the things that were not urgent but very important and because there weren't that many things, there were a lot of things that were noise and different in our life, what happens when we don't have a plan is almost everything we do is in that bottom right-hand window. It's not urgent and it's not important. Here, what are some examples of that? Spending 30 minutes looking at Facebook. It's not urgent. It's not important. Watching Netflix. It's not urgent. It's not important. Sitting and doing whatever. I mean, wasting time. Whatever we waste time on. Video games. Whatever. It, video games are not urgent or important. But by the way, 
video games and social media are designed to make you feel that they are urgent and important. That's why they have pop-up windows. That's why they keep giving you a sense of urgency. They're designed to make you feel like they're both urgent and important, when in reality, they're neither urgent nor important. They're neither of them. The problem is most of us don't know the difference between pressure and priority. Most of us, we don't know the difference between something important to do and an activity. We don't know the difference between urgent and important. And there is a big difference between urgent and important. Not every fire that everyone wants you to put out is important for you to put out. Not everything that the world demands of you is important to you. So what I'm talking about is goals focus me to where I can know what's important to me. What has God called me to do? Look at your to-do list for Monday. If you don't have one, that's part of the problem. The most urgent things on your to-do list are probably not the most important things on your to-do list. As a matter of fact, I've arranged my list now on the day so that I have the things that are important and the things that are urgent so that I can block out times for the things that are important, and that way I can reduce the urgent stuff so I have time for the important stuff. The truth is, most things that are urgent in our life are very irrelevant for our long-term life. Urgent usually means unimportant, and important things are rarely urgent. Important things are almost never urgent, things like exercise or reading or studying or getting a college degree or, or what these things are not usually urgent, but they're very important. The problem is the important stuff gets pushed to the bottom of the list by the urgent stuff. We end up with, we end up, the world tells us what's urgent and we end up letting it define my day rather than defining my own day. Some examples, spending time with your kids. Very important but it's usually not that urgent. It's usually not something that's urgent and it's not on our to-do list, so it ends up getting pushed to the bottom of my list by hundreds of trivial things that the world told me I needed to do, and the next thing you know, I've neglected my kids another day. Spending more time in God's Word is the same way, isn't it? If you don't set time to spend time in God's Word, something that's very important if you're going to be a Christ follower, but it's not urgent. The world won't spend all of its axes and Jesus won't hate you for missing a day of doing your devotionals, right? It's not that urgent, but it's extremely important, and if you don't include it in your list, it won't happen. Developing relationships are the same way. How do we build relationships in the middle of this weird season we're in? I don't know, but we need to spend some time and set some goals there. How do we grow our faith? I don't know. We need to spend some time and set some goals in growing our faith. You know what really happened in the book of Numbers? Their goal was off. Their goal was comfort. Their goal was dictated to them by their circumstances. God had given them a massive goal of taking a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and they end up missing the whole goal, and they waste a whole generation, 40 years. In the last 10 chapters that we come to now, those last 10 chapters are about focusing, refocusing a new generation on the goal. But the old generation wasted their lives because they had no goal. God gave them a clear goal. They couldn't live up to the goal we got a week of prayer fasting coming next week. Um, try fasting some stuff, like maybe the news channels. You know what I've learned about the news? Anything they're reporting about now is probably not important. You, you know how they fill the time in the news? They create a crisis. You, you ever notice the news channels that says breaking news all the time? Breaking news! I mean, yeah, right, breaking news. Breaking news! Somebody stubbed their toe! And, and yeah, I guess it is breaking news, but it's not important. And 90% of what they're talking about isn't going to matter a year from now. So, so they're just creating crisis. You know, the truth is, if you skip the news for a week, you'd probably have a better perspective on what matters in a week. Uh, whatever survived. Uh, sometimes I think we'd be better off to read what happened a week ago because then we'd know what ended up mattering. The truth is, if it's important, it'll still be important in a week. Try fasting the talk shows, the social media. What about that? Try fasting social media for a little while. Or maybe fast some people on social media because some people are drainers for me. They, you know, you can't hide them and they don't even know you hid them. Some people just drain me. I see them on social media and they just pull the energy. I have to fast some people. Maybe if you did that, you could hear God for a little while. Uh, goals focus our energy. 1 Corinthians 9, 26. I do not run without a goal. I fight like a boxer who is hitting something, not just the air. In other words, I don't waste my energy flailing around with no productivity and no results. I don't just run around swinging into the midair. I, I make sure I punch something that matters. 
God says, I want to give you hope and focus through some godly goals in, in, in 2021. Third thing godly goals do is they stretch my faith. If you have no goals in life, you're not really living in faith. You're not taking any risks. You're coasting through life. Goals are really little statements of faith. They're statements about my faith. Here's how you write out some goals, okay? Copy this sentence down. I believe God can do blank in blank time. I believe God can lead us to reach 100 people in 2021. That's a goal, and it excites me. It makes me excited to think of 100 people finding Jesus in 2021. I believe God can do blank in blank time. That's what it takes to stretch our faith. The goal is to, is to say, here is what I'm trusting God for in my finances, in my family, in my career, in my dreams. I believe God can show me a way to get out of debt by the end of 2021. I believe God can lead me to a better job in 2021. I believe God can give me a new career in 2021. I believe God can bring me a potential husband or wife in 2021. I believe God can bring me... And, and, and those are goals that pull us forward. Matthew 9, 29, Jesus said, According to your faith, it will be done to you. That's a pretty chilling verse, isn't it? You ever think about that? According to what you believe, that's what you're going to get. What you believe for, that's what you're going to get. And the chilling part of the verse is, many of us aren't believing God for anything. And we're, you know what we're getting? Nothing. We don't get a shower of blessing because we're not trusting him for nothing. In other words, you get to choose how much God blesses you. You want a little bit of blessing? Then trust him for a little bit of stuff. You want a big blessing? Trust him for a lot of stuff in 2021. But if you don't trust him at all, you're not going to get any blessing at all. Trust is attempting to do something that I can't do in my own power. Never done it before. That uh, never done something in God's power means that I've never been blessed by God yet. If I've only done what I can do in my own power, that's not a goal. A goal has nothing to do with what I can do right now. My goal right now is not to preach this sermon to you. I'm already doing that. The goal is not what you're already doing or what you can do. A goal is what God has told you could be in the future. And, and if you don't ever have anything you're looking to the future on, you're not being blessed by God yet. This church is full of ordinary people that have kept believing God for the impossible. Today's impossibility was, uh, was tomorrow's miracle. What we think is impossible for us right now is what we're going to look back on tomorrow and say, God did that, didn't he? Uh, the possibilities that we had, the, the impossibilities we had yesterday are now today's possibilities. We trusted God for buildings. I mean, I, I was talking to, to one of our oldest, oldest attendees here who remembered when we met in the dance studio because we had nowhere else to be and we couldn't afford anywhere else and now we sit in this building and we take it for granted but it was a huge miracle we got this building for free it was a it was a huge miracle and it and maybe we've forgotten that yesterday's impossibility have now been today's possibility we can unlock the door and walk in here finances and people and how god's blessed us some people have looked at this church and said, who do those people think they are? I still get that question from people, especially other pastors. Who do you all think you are down there? I, it's not who we think we are. It's who we think God is. It's who we believe God is. The, so the size of your God determines the size of your goals. Goals based on your ability are going to mean that you're the God of your goals and God of your 2021, and they're going to be puny bulk goals. Goals based on what God is capable of will lead us to blessing, hope, and faith. So I'm asking God for 100 souls this year in this church. I'm asking him that new ministries, that, the, that, that, that some LCCers rise up and say, I can make a difference and I'm going to do this. Some new leaders that say, I can lead, I can, I can help people move forward. Think about it. If I'm asking God for 100 souls, I need about 10 of you all who can disciple those people. I need people who can disciple and are serious about leading. And, and you know, all that's impossible if none of us listen to them. That goal means all of us have to listen to them. Here's a verse for people who step out in faith. It's one of my favorite verses out of Ephesians. God is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or dream of. It, infinitely beyond our highest prayers and desires and thoughts and hopes. We've had some big dreams in this church, and I still have some big dreams for this church. I'd like to see this church plant some more churches. 
I'd like to see this church do some relational campuses across this area and region. I'd like to see us still build some sort of community building here in the middle of Bealton to serve the people of Bealton. I'd like to see a movement of small town churches that can come together and pool some resources and reach little cow pasture towns like we're in right now. Is that impossible? God's already done the impossible stuff for us. He's already put us together, given us buildings, given us... He's already done the impossible stuff. Why wouldn't he do the rest of the stuff? When we look at what God has done, it brings us to the fact that God can do anything. The goal in 2021, then, is to take this church to a place where we have nothing but trust in him. And 2020 has done a lot of that for us. For some of you all, 2020 has taught you that you must trust him because our plans don't mean that much. Our ideas, our wonderful visions, what we need is to trust him for his goal and his vision. God gives us hope and focuses our energy, strengthens our faith. One of the verses we're going to look at when we get into Hebrews, and I've mentioned it a few times in the last few weeks, says, without faith it is impossible to please God. It also says everything that doesn't come from faith is sin. Let me dare you this. Why don't you dream the biggest dream you can in 2021? Dreams are free. They don't cost anything. They don't cost a thing. And every great thing that's ever happened began with a dream. It began with an idea that could happen. Set some goals for your life and ask, what would stretch my faith? Fourth thing that dreams and goals do is godly goals build my character. God's goal for you, you know God has a goal for you, right? God's goal for you is this, to help you grow up spiritually, to make you like Jesus in character. God's goal for you is to change your character. Jesus is a perfect example of how that works. Jesus thought like, acted like, felt like, responded like God. Jesus said when you look at him, you've seen the Father because he responded like God. So life is a course in character development. And that's why life's hard. That's why some of you have tragedies. That's why 2020 came along. That's why, why did these things happen in 2020? Because God's giving us an opportunity to develop our character. Heaven's easy. There's no problems in heaven. You're never going to have an opportunity to develop your character in heaven because there won't be any problems. There'll be no pandemic. There'll be no murder hornets. There'll be no riots in the streets. None of that will happen in heaven. Simple truth is it'll be easy. There won't be any problems. But life here is full of problems. You know why? Because God's building our, building our character to get ready for heaven. Uh, what you are becoming determines what you'll accomplish. So why set goals? Why, why set goals? You know, while you work on your goal, God works on you. While you're working on your goal, God is working on his goal in you, which is to build your character. You want to change your circumstances, your finances, your family, your career. God needs to work on your character and changing you first. In order to get you to the goal, he's got to change you. Being like Jesus is not something that happens fast. It's not something you come up here and pray and speak in tongues and all of a sudden you're just like Jesus. It's not. Tongues are a wonderful tool to bring us so that we can focus on Jesus, but they're a tool to focus us on Jesus. The, the truth is, being like Jesus is going to take you a lifetime. It's going to take all of your life for God to temper you and make you like Jesus. The two most common mistakes then we make in goal setting is either we either set our goals too low, there's something we could do right now and that's not a goal at all, or we try to accomplish them too quickly. I want to start a ministry and reach 100 people, and when it doesn't happen tomorrow, I'm discouraged and think it's never going to happen, and I fall apart because I wanted it to happen now. The, the, the solution is to set some bigger goals and give yourself a lifetime to accomplish them. Set some goals that require some time to accomplish. My goal for this church is that we reach 10,000 people. Not there yet, are we? But I'm committed to it. I believe we could be there. I believe that could happen. I believe if we'll pull together and hear from God and everybody do what God told them to do, that will happen. I believe it's coming. I believe it, and I've given 20 years to moving toward that goal. The simple truth is, it's still a goal for me. It's still a goal for this church. The problem is we always overestimate what we can do in a year, and we vastly underestimate what we can get done in 10. Think about it. We always think we're going to accomplish a million things in a year, and we think 10 years from now we'll have nothing done. Goals accomplish two major things. First of all, people admire people with goals. The Bible says if your goals are good, you'll be respected. But if you're looking for trouble, that's what you're going to get. People admire goals. People admire somebody who has a vision. 
And goals also please God. The Bible says the conduct of the wicked is abhorrent to God, but he loves the person whose goal is uprightness. So if my goal is to grow in character, God loves that, it says. The problem is God doesn't bless every goal. My message today doesn't tell you, let's go set any old goal and expect God to bless it. My goal is to have a brand new car. And that may be a goal and it may be something you need, but more likely it's a goal you're trying to get God to bless. I'm not saying sit down and write your wish list and believe God's Santa Claus and all you have to do is ask him and he's going to bless it. What we need is godly goals because God blesses the godly part of the word godly goals. You're going to need to set some goals and you might as well choose the ones that God blesses. How do we know the ones that God blesses? Let's look real quick at four characteristics of a godly goal. First of all, a godly goal is based on God's purpose for me. It's my goal, and it's God's purpose for me. When I think about goals, I could think of a million. When I think about all the things that could happen, it paralyzes me. The possibilities are endless. Focus means to look at some basics. Godly goals need to come from God's purpose for me. God's purpose for me is different than God's purpose for you. And that means that you could have different goals than I have, and they could both be godly goals. The, the key is, are you asking God to serve your purpose, or are you asking him to help you serve your purpose? And that's a huge difference. The, your, your purpose, if it's to know him, to grow more, to serve him, to share his love to this community, to honor him. If those are your goals, then God will bless those goals. If your goals aren't related to his purpose, it's not a godly goal, and it distracts you from God. The, the good news about God is his purpose never changes. The good news about God is his purpose is the same in Genesis as it is in Revelation. It never changes. We're able to, just like setting our watch, you're able to set your goals by God's purposes because they're always the same. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 9, I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. Paul was driven by something eternal, by a real goal, by a purpose. Life is like a race. You know, races have a couple characteristics. First of all, a race has a predetermined finish line. Remember when we were kids and we would have a race and some idiot was always changing the finish line? Oh, no, I was racing to here. No, I was racing to here. And it wasn't really a race, was it? Because it's only a race if we have a finish line. And the finish line, the runners, they don't change. The finish line is there. And to win the race, we're going to have to cross the finish line. When you're halfway through, you're still halfway through. You can't get tired and call it the finish line. If you're going to run a marathon, you can't stop at 13 miles and say, I'm done, this is the new finish line, I'll win. It doesn't work that way. When we have a goal, when we have a race, the race has a fixed finish line. And until you get there, you're still in the race. Maybe you're laying in bed and you can't move right now. Maybe your health won't let you leave your living room right now. Maybe you're laying in bed paralyzed and can't get up. You're still here. You're still in the race. And there's still something you can do to progress God's goals for you. You can pray. You can pray for me. Some of the most help I've ever had in this church have been people who can't leave their living room, but homebound people laying in a bed who can do nothing but pray for me. And some of the people I miss the most in this church are those who have passed on who were that, laying in a bed at the end of their life, who knew enough about Jesus to pray for me and pray for this church. You can still do something if you're still here. Second thing I want you to understand about these races are you can only win a race one step at a time. There isn't an instant win. There isn't a shortcut. There isn't a fast way to get from start to finish. It's not a 30-yard dash. The race of life is a long-term marathon. That's why Paul said, I run with purpose in every step. Some of you made a lot of missteps early in life. I did. Paul did. Some of you all did. Some of you all ran around like idiots for the first few years or for the past part of your life, or maybe you're still running around like an idiot. I don't know. The, the point is, I, I saw that I was still in the race. Maybe I ran in some wrong directions early on, and maybe you're still running in the wrong direction, but you're still here, you're still in the race, and the truth is it's not over until you get to the end. It's not the over until we take that last step. You can always choose to run the race. We can always choose to put purpose in every step. Marathons are forgiving. One good thing about a marathon, a 50-yard dash is not forgiving. One misstep and you lost. Marathon, you can stop and take a restroom break if you want to. 
You can stop take a nap for 10 minutes if you want to. They're forgiving. One fall doesn't put you out of the race in a marathon. And the good news is you're still in the race. Maybe you've missed your purpose in 2020, but there's still time to change. Jesus is a good example, John 14, 28. The Father is the goal and the purpose of my life. He said his whole goal and purpose was the Father. Jesus didn't make up his goals as he went. He prayed and he got his goal from God. The number one way to get a godly goal is to ask God for it. God, give me a goal. Take some time this week. Take some time during the week of prayer and say, God, would you give me one of those goals? Would you give me something that gets me out of bed in the morning? Would you give me something that that you could do through me this year? You know, the number two way to get a godly goal is to read this. Because you'll find in this all sorts of people that had godly goals, and the Holy Spirit will speak to you and say, that's your goal too. If Gideon did it, you can do it. If David did it, you can do it. If David could slay a giant, you can slay a giant this year. If Jesus can do it, you can do it. If Paul could do it, you can do it. Because it's the same God working in every one of them, the same one working in you. Um, 2 Corinthians 10.13 says our goal is to stay within the boundaries of God's plan for us. You don't have to do it all. You do what God put into your boundaries. It's easy to look at this church, and as we start trying to move forward again into having physical church, we'll have a million things that need done, and a million things that, as right now our hospitality team hasn't come together in a year, our kids' zone team hasn't come together in nearly a year. There'll be a million things to be done, and they'll all be good things. And it'll be easy for some of you all to wear yourself out, but we need to stop wearing ourselves out and find the things God's called us to do. Because everything here would be a good thing to do. It's just whether it's what God told you to do or not. Some things are in your boundaries. Some things are out of bounds to you. That's why we're a team. That's why we need each other as a church. Ephesians 4.1, Paul says, I'm in prison because I belong to the Lord. And God calls you to be his people. So I urge you to live the life to which God has called you. Paul says, my calling right now is to be in prison. Your calling is to do what God called you to do. You can't do it all. You can only do what God called you to do. Second characteristic of a godly goal is this. The goal, the aim of a godly goal is to bring glory to God. God blesses goals that bring him the glory. Not goals that bring you the glory. He blesses goals that bring him the glory. 1 Corinthians 10. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. The glory of God's not just religious stuff. Okay, it's your life goal. The glory of God is not what we do on Sunday morning when the music's playing. The glory of God is what you should be asking God for every morning. It's what you should be thanking Him for every night. God, get some glory. Get, shine in my life and let the world see you and me. How do we do it? The first step to having God get glory out of your life is to have the right attitude. Talked about this a couple weeks ago at one of my favorite holidays, Thanksgiving. Gratitude is always the right attitude. If I do it with gratitude, I'll give God glory. If I do it with arrogance, I'll take God's glory. There's always something to be grateful for. Always something, no matter how life gets. Second way that we do this to bring glory to God is we do it with the right motivation. I want to do it so that my life pleases Him. So that it honors Him. So it expresses how He made me. I want to live my life and every day of my life with a godly goal of doing it so that He can be seen in my life. You need this series because you need godly goals. You need hope, you need power, you need faith, you need character. Godly goals celebrate God's character. The key is to sit and listen to God, to hear his voice over the next couple weeks. Stop praying that God blesses whatever you're doing and start doing what God's already blessing. Start doing the things that he is blessing. Do what he put you here on earth to do. The third thing godly goals do is they're motivated by love. Non-godly goals are motivated by greed, pride, Ego, arrogance, anger, guilt, any motivation of greed, pride, anger, guilt, those are not godly goals. The Bible says, let love be your highest goal. Why? Because God is love and his goal is that you express that love and you become like him. So our highest goals are in relationships, not achievements. Let me say it again, it's very important. Your highest goals are in relationships, not achievements. It's not go and get a prize or a medal. It's who you do it with. Your goals are about who you live with. Your goals are about who you do church with. Your goals are about who you work with. Your goals are about the people that you're around. There are two kinds of love that motivate your goals. Love for God and love for his people. Philippians 3 says, Because of the supreme advantage of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, 
I count everything else as loss. In other words, now that I know Jesus, everything else seems like it's nothing. Now that I know Jesus, what other goals do I need? Uh, so that I may come to know him and the power of his resurrection and partake of his suffering, striving toward the goal of the resurrection from the dead. Uh, I know there's more than this, and that means my goals change. I know that this world is not all there is. If this is all there is, then money is a wonderful goal. Power is a wonderful goal. Having fun is a wonderful goal. If this is all there is, but if heaven is real, those are not the right goals. When you see eternity, it changes your goals. When you know Jesus, you realize it will be worth it all, and you set goals because you love him. The Bible tells us nobody's ever seen God. It says no one here on this earth has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and God's love has reached its goal. If I fail to love people, I fail to love God. Let me say that again. If I fail to love people, I fail to love God. I am not living in his goals. My goals are not about using people to get where I'm going. My goals are about blessing people. Goals are about people. God's goal for you is to learn to love, especially the hard to love. If we're going to reach 100 people this year, we're going to have to love the hard to love people. The problem is I start loving my goals more than my people, and I, more than people, and I start using people to get to my goals. When I use people, God will cut off my blessing. Last thing goals do is godly goals are achieved in God's power. Let's get personal. How many goals have you failed at? How many times have you failed at a goal? You know why we fail at goals? Because we set our own goals without God, try, and we try to accomplish it in our own power. We try to change our life, and we fail. Next week, you're going to have New Year's resolutions. Those are goals, and how many of them fail? They fail because we try not try to do them without God's power and without God's motive. Some of you are burnt out. You know why you burn out trying to set goals? Because you've been setting the wrong goals, and you've been trying to do those wrong goals in your own power. The Bible says this, Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, and you are now trying to attain your goal by human effort, we plan the way we want to live, but only God makes us able to live it. Are we so foolish that we keep trying to do it in our own power? If we're able to do it without God's power, it wasn't a godly goal for you anyhow. If you're able to do it without God's power, it isn't even a goal. It's just something you ought to be doing. Goal setting accounts for God's sovereignty. It, accept, it, 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 it holds into account that God might adjust my goals, enlarge my goals as I grow, as my character grows. The challenge sets some godly goals for this week. Maybe, maybe they're not perfect goals, but they get you moving. Humility before God is to be humbly submit to his goals and allow him to clarify them as we move forward. John, uh, James chapter 4 says, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. So you ought to say if it's the Lord's will, we'll live and do this or that. God's goal is bigger than my goal. God's able to steer me towards his goals if I'm moving towards something. You can't steer your car when it's sitting still in a parking lot. You can turn the wheel, it's hard to turn, but it doesn't actually go anywhere. You want to steer your car, you've got to get rolling. You may start rolling in the wrong direction, but if you have goals, you'll steer to the right direction. A ship that's off course will be much easier to put on course if the ship is moving. If it's sitting still, it can't change course. You cannot change course till you start moving, and your initial steps may not be in the, clear, in the right direction. Don't wait until it's perfect. Start moving toward the goals. Set some goals and allow God to begin working in his power. The Bible says you will not succeed by your own strength or your own power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. How do you get God's power into your goal? You trust God with all your heart. You don't depend on your own understanding, your plans. You seek his will in all you do, and you let him direct your paths. The starting point is before doing godly goals, you need to know God. Some of you, that's what you need. You need to renew your relationship with God. It's not going to be a godly goal if you don't know God. If you don't know him, as we conclude this, would you open up your life to him? Some of you need to renew. I told you, godly goals are about relationship. And the first relationship that matters is your relationship to Jesus. He who loved you enough to die for you, he who loved you enough to set you free, rose from the dead to give you power, fills you with his spirit. Maybe you need to be filled fresh with his spirit. Maybe you need the power of Jesus living in you. Maybe you need to renew that relationship. So the goal for right now in this next song is that we open up our life to him. 
Our goal right now is that we worship him in this next song, that we worship him in a way that brings us relationally to know him. Dear Lord, would you help me to trust you? Would you help each of us? Help us to set goals that honor you. Fill us with hope, focus. Fill us with faith and character in 2021. Lord, I don't want to drift through another year. I don't want to drift through another decade. I don't want to drift through the rest of my life. Help me to return next week and find some godly relationships, to set some goals for my life. And Lord, we ask that your power be seen and built in built in this church in 2021. And Lord, I ask you that you speak to every person as we worship you in this song. You give us a godly goal, our goal, not, not everybody else's goal. It's what you've asked us to do. Give us the patience to run the race and to allow you to build us into the person that can live in the goal that you've called us to. Shower us with blessings as we begin to worship you right now, Lord. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Pray 2021 is a shower of blessing for you. We're going to explore that over the next few weeks, so don't miss next week. 
We're going to look at some goals in a couple specific areas of our lives. 2021 is going to be the best year. We're going to make the best year followed by one of the, preceded by one of the most challenging years. But that's often how it works. It's often exactly how it goes. The last pandemic, the flu pandemic in the early 1900s was followed by the roaring 20s. And I believe God wants to bless and pour out something after this last season. And I want to position us for it. And you need some goals to be positioned for that. You want to receive the blessing, you need to set the goals. We're going to work on this for the next few weeks. Plan on praying with us next week. Plan on being here next Sunday as we look at some other areas of our life. We're going to have the best year ever. 2021 is going to be a year, no matter what goes on, our year doesn't depend on what goes on in the world. Our year depends upon how much Jesus is working in our lives. So I pray that happens in your life this week. I'll be praying for you this week as we go through this, as we move into a new year, as we say goodbye to the old. And I'll be praying that God speaks to you and gives you your goals and gives you your plans for 2021. Join us next week as we explore this more. Thank you for coming. We'll see you next week.